Few jobs in the 21st century have as much responsibility as being the commanding officer of a nuclear-powered aircraft carrier. And for details about what that job entails, I wanted to bring aboard my longtime good friend, retired Navy Vice Admiral Ted Slapshot Carter. Slapshot did it all as a Tomcat radar intercept officer during his active duty career. He has 6,300 total flight hours, 4,300 hours in the F-14, 2016 arrested landings. He was the gray owl, meaning the senior naval flight officer during his time on active duty. And he's also in the Rhode Island Hall of Fame. So let's talk to Slapshot. So Admiral, let's start with the point in your career where you get your wings. So I got my wings in September of 1982, a little bit uh, over uh, a year and a few months from uh, when I graduated at Navy in 1981. Uh, I wanted to go F-14 Tomcats as a NFO Rio, and uh, I got bit a little bit by uh, the quality spread. I was number two in my class, and I got F-4 Phantoms, and I thought my career was over and uh, ended up going to uh, Japan and flying in the VF-161. And it was uh, arguably one of the best things that ever happened, flying off the Midway, the last of the F-4 Phantom. I had over a thousand hours in the airplane. So it was a great start to my flying career. So you, you had to be like one of the last guys to get F-4s, right? It was, yeah. There were only two classes. There were a handful. Uh, and uh, it even led to me going to Top Gun in an F-4 Phantom in 1985 while they were beginning the filming of the movie. Uh, but that was a pretty special class. It was the last Top Gun class to have the F-4 Phantom in it as a, you know, uh, standard uh, eight jet Top Gun class, all Phantoms. So you went through the rag at Oceana. Was that where the F-4 rag is at? The, at yeah, the F-171. Uh, that was the last of uh, F-4s. And then uh, the handful that went out to the USS Midway for the Navy actually went through the Marine Corps rag, VMF uh, AT-101. Uh, and, uh, so yeah, I got to fly with the, the Vietnam legends that were still flying the F4. They were, you know, really proud about that. Uh, and it was a big influence to me to kind of really learn the, the culture of the fighter aviation. So aboard Midway, forward deployed out in, uh, yeah. what fleet was that? Seventh fleet back in those days. Seventh right? fleet. Uh, and, uh, I got to Japan just right after, uh, Korean Airline 007 was shot down, if you remember that, on right. September 1st, 1983. Uh, and then I started flying right operationally off the Midway. My first launch on Midway ever on a cat shot was uh, on Alert 5, 350-mile intercept of a TU-95 Bear. Uh, that's, how, that's how my flying career started. So remind people, Midway only had three wires and two cats, right? Yeah, so Midway was built at the tail end of World War II. It was the largest ship ever built in history in its time, and it was a straight deck carrier. It never served in World War II, but as it went through, you know, its its paces in the 1950s, it was turned into an angle deck, uh, and now a uh, historic ship sitting in the harbor in San Diego. So uh, I got to be in the the last of the F-4s on board Midway. Pretty pretty special time in my uh, my life to be on board that historic ship. So you roll out of that tour. Is that when you transitioned to Tomcats or what happened after that? Yeah, I went right into Tomcats, flew uh, as an F-14 uh, fleet replacement squadron instructor, uh, got qualified in the Tomcat, flew out of Miramar. Uh, the Top Gun movie had just come out, so it was that whole era. Uh, and I stayed as a flight instructor uh, in the F-14 there for almost four years. And uh, my my specialty was uh, teaching young pilots from the back seat, as you know, with no stick and throttle, uh, how to qualify and land on, a, on an aircraft carrier. And that's, that's really probably where I made my aviation mark early on. You also designed the, the fin flash at that time. Yeah. Um, you and I are creative types and, and we're inclined to do that kind of thing while we're also acting as aviators. And it is memorialized on the Naval Academy grounds, the, the airplane that's on the grounds of the Naval Academy is that design that you yeah. came up with. Yeah, myself and a, another uh, NFO named Ian Anderson, he and I together uh, developed that paint job. And I was amazed how easy it was. We, we did it on graph paper and we took it down to the, you know, the, uh, the maintenance desk. And we said, what do you think about this paint job? And they're like, yeah, we like it. Let's try it. And it became our air show bird because, you know, we, we were doing air shows back then. There was an East Coast version that Snort Snodgrass was doing and the West Coast version 
that was uh, Randy Pogo Clark, a uh, former Blue Angel. He developed that show that started with the dirty roll on takeoff and some pretty crazy maneuvers. Um, and they, we did all that in, the, in that paint job. So you're in the rag for a long time, for starting as a student, then as an instructor, sort of a Sir Grad Rio, if you will. Yeah. And uh, so then, then what happens? Well, because I had, and, and remember, this was an era where we had, uh, we, we were at 15 aircraft carriers. Uh, we were producing a lot of pilots and NFOs. Uh, I flew every day, often twice a day. Uh, I taught 31 different pilots uh, landing skills on aircraft carriers. So when I left VF-124 to go to uh, VF-21, the freelancers as a, you know, kind of super junior officer, eventually department head, I already had 750 carrier landings, you know, combined with the 350 plus I had on USS Midway. So I had a lot of carrier landing experience and I was a, uh, I was still in my 30s uh, when I joined VF-21, uh, which you can see the plaque behind me is a VF-21 plaque. That's the plaque I got when I made my thousandth landing, uh, and that was in uh, uh, 1991. So 91, people thinking Desert Storm. Where were you during that conflict? Yeah, so uh, I was uh, on board the USS Independence. We were deployed off the coast of Diego Garcia when uh, Saddam Hussein invaded into Kuwait. Uh, we were the first ship uh, on station. We were off the coast of UAE by 9 August. Uh, myself and a couple other planners were uh, flown into Bahrain. I was on the ground floor of all that. Uh, we flew the first probe missions uh, into the Gulf uh, across the landmass of Oman and UAE. Uh, and we, uh, we kind of held the fort till everybody showed up during Desert Shield. And then VF-21 uh, departed as we were traded out with the USS Midway of all aircraft carriers. Uh, and we headed home. And then we eventually replaced USS Midway as the forward deployed aircraft carrier in Japan. So that tour ends. Then you're kind of waiting to screen for command. What did you do after your department head tour? Yeah, so I was already in Japan. And uh, I went to work for uh, then Captain Bud Langston as the Air Wing 5 commander. I was the Air Wing operations officer for about a year and a half. Uh, as we uh, transitioned the F-14 Tomcat uh, into Japan. And uh, we did another deployment uh, in 92. That was uh, the beginning of uh, Operation Southern Watch uh, doing the no-fly zone. I was on the first mission of that. Uh, and then when I finished that tour, I went to a U.S. Central Command where I became a Tomahawk cruise missile expert and did a lot of Tomahawk cruise missile planning, a couple operational missions there in 1993. Uh, and uh, ended up getting pulled up into the, uh, the front office where I was uh, General Butch Neal's executive assistant, uh, did that for a year and uh, got a lot of exposure to the senior ranks. Uh, uh, you know, uh, General Binford P was the uh, Central Command commander at the time. So uh, a lot of interesting things going around there in 1994, 95. I screened for command and then uh, went back to Miramar. Uh, I became the chief of staff for the fighter wing as we were closing Miramar down. Uh, and that was the years of 96 going into 97. In fact, uh, I had the distinction of being in the backseat of the last Tomcat that left the, the runway uh, in Miramar in early January of 1997. Uh, another uh, young lieutenant, uh, Sledge Richter, and I flew that jet out of Miramar on a late Tuesday and, you know, you, you got to go across time zone. So we ended up landing at Oceana at two o'clock in the morning. And true to form, fighter form, they left the bar open. They took, <laughs> there was note of the significance of that event. And there were still about 50 fighter guys at the Oceana bar to acknowledge the closing of Naval Air Station Miramar and that turnover of the Marine Corps. So you know, one of those moments in history that never gets anything, but maybe a small footnote, but uh, a big memory in my in my life. Absolutely. And we'll remind the viewers that Miramar is now a Marine Corps air station. Yeah. Um, we didn't close the base. It didn't get bracked. It just got transitioned to a, a Marine Corps facility. Um, so you're CEO of which squadron then? So I was a executive officer, uh, then eventually commanding officer of VF-14, the top hatters. And uh, what was interesting about that, the top batters were about to be disestablished. And then there was a change. And if you may, may recall the whole switch around with VF-103, uh, VF-84, kind of to save the Jolly Rogers uh, logo, 
the top hatters were somehow involved in that and a decision was made because it was the oldest continuous operating squadron in the U.S. Navy. Somebody kind of figured out it'd be a bad idea to get rid of that outfit. So I was there during that resurrection period of time and uh, I did a deployment on Kennedy as an executive officer, came back and this is as we were putting the lantern on the Tomcat and, and we were flying the oldest F-14As. Uh, many of my airplanes in that squadron were the oldest in the fleet still flying. My youngest pilots were younger than the airplanes. Uh, and I did the combat deployment in 1999 on board the USS Theodore Roosevelt uh, with VF-14 and our sister squadron VF-41. So that we're talking about the combat deployment uh, of Kosovo, right? Uh, is that the conflict we're talking about there? Yep, 55 days of combat in Kosovo. I led the very first strike into Kosovo, about a 40-plane strike uh, with the GBU-12 1,000-pound laser-guided bombs to take out the uh, fuel facility for all of the jets uh, that were stationed at Pristina Air Base. Uh, very high-impact uh, flight, a lot of missiles in the air, uh, uh, AAA, uh, all just amazing event. Uh, only three of us actually got to the target because so many were defending themselves against missiles. Uh, but we took out the uh, the target, went on to fly. Uh, I ended up flying about 125 combat missions over the next uh, six months because after we left that conflict, we went right into direct conflict in Iraq. This was kind of the post end of um, the no-fly zone, Southern Watch, but really kind of the precursor ops of what was to come in 2003. I got home from that deployment in November of 1999, and uh, I got a phone call within a week of being back. It was Admiral Timbo Keating. He was on a selection board, and he called me and said, uh, hey, Slapshot, I got great news for you. You've been selected for the nuclear power program. And I was uh, in almost utter shock. I said, did you actually get my email where I said I was not interested? And he said, yeah, we disregarded that. So well, congratulations. And I said, can I, can I say no? He said, you can always say no. And I said, well, what would that mean? He goes, I, I can't tell you. So I said, yes. Uh, it was myself and uh, Mike Nasty Manaz. We got the phone call the same night. And the only thing we were able to negotiate is that he and I would be in the nuclear power class together. So what so did you want to do? What are the options at that point? You said, yeah. you know, let's explain to the viewers how that matrix works post squadron command. Yeah, if you're if you're upwardly mobile and the Navy makes that decision, and that usually means you've got to be the number one on rare occasion, the number two ranked commanding officers out of nine commanding officers in a competitive fitness report. Uh, the Navy makes a determination whether you're going to go on to command an air wing, a carrier air wing. In other words, be in charge of the 70 plus airplanes that will be on the flight deck in the hangar bay of an aircraft carrier or go this other path where you will start a 10 year career path with the chance, not the guarantee that you could command a nuclear powered aircraft carrier. So that was the invitation. And the only guarantee you get is if you make it through nuclear power school, you'll go to an aircraft carrier, nuclear powered aircraft carrier will be you'll be the number two guy, meaning you'll be the executive officer. And then you will go command a deep draft ship. So you're guaranteed command of a deep draft ship. And then you had to be competitive again with about a 60% opportunity chance to command then one of our 12 nuclear powered aircraft carriers. We have 11 today. I think the analogy in terms of training track is going from med school to be a brain surgeon. You know, I mean, this is not something that just happens overnight, as you've just described. First, you have to be number one among, you said, nine. And just to put a finer point on it for the viewers, these are all the squadron COs in an air wing. Right. Including the helicopter CO. Correct. And uh, so you got to be number one or, as you said, maybe number two. And then there's a lot of wickets by the time you get to your carrier command. And I thought I knew what the path was going to be. And remember, this was you know back in 1999. We really... Uh, one of the first things I heard uh, when I interviewed uh, was uh, this is how unique this group is that get to command a nuclear powered aircraft carrier. There's about half as many nuclear powered aircraft carrier commanding officers as we have astronauts that have gone into space. So, you know how we elevate astronauts that go into space, less than half numbers. And that's still true today. I think 524 people have actually achieved that level of going into 
uh, from you know, low Earth orbit or into deep space. And we just crossed over 200 nuclear powered commanding officers. Uh, and our first woman, Amy Bauerschmidt, uh, who just uh, left with the USS Abraham Lincoln. So, uh, you know, it's a it's a very, very small elite group that get to go do that. And we'll also note that she's a helicopter pilot. And she's so that's also, pilot. you know, that's a, a rarity that uh, an HS skipper winds up uh, getting command of a nuclear powered aircraft carrier. Yeah. And she's incredibly competent. She's going to do great. Roger that. So what was your major at the academy? So I pointed that out when they <laughs> when they selected me. And of course, just as uh Everybody that goes to uh, either nuclear submarines or nuclear aircraft carriers, you have to go interview. And this is like the follow on to a Hyman G. Rickover. So I still had to go interview uh, for getting into the program, which I kind of had somewhat dismissed. Now, it's interesting. Uh, I was uh, fortunate enough to receive the uh, Admiral Stockdale Leadership Award. Big deal in Washington, D.C. It was uh, given to me, uh, nominated by your peers. I go to Washington, D.C., I get this award. Admiral Stockdale is actually there with his wife, Sybil. The last time they were there together in 1999, he passed away in 2005. She just passed away a couple of years ago. And I had to go do my nuke interview that afternoon after I got this award, after all this you know, hoopla. And uh, I, had, I wasn't prepared. I mean, I was an oceanography major at the Naval Academy with a 2.4 GPA. I had a lot of A's and some high Bs in all of my technical courses, which is what got me in. Um, but I hadn't really opened up a book for 20 years. I hadn't done anything with Boyle's Law or Archimedes Principle. I mean, these were questions they expect you to be able to get on a whiteboard and diagram and explain. Uh, so I was, uh, I was off to a rough start. Uh, I did get in through the interview, probably because I got the Stockdale Award, and then I had to go to work. Uh, and I will tell you that year and a half of going to nuke power school was probably the hardest I've ever worked in my life. Um, I was, remember pirate, our good friend, pirate Barbary described it as aviators know how to tell time, but the new power program expects you to know how to build a watch. That's right. So, uh, that, that just resonates with me. Um, so as you said, it is hard. As you've mentioned, there are wickets and not everybody makes it. We, both know some guys who, who didn't make it through. Right. I think yeah. they're biased to, to help you, but uh, some guys just don't have, let's say, the acuity to make it through. Yeah, it's three phases to get to the nuclear power program. There's the nuke power school. That's uh, about a seven-month program down at uh, uh, Goose Creek down in South Carolina. There's, there's a whole nuclear power schoolhouse there. And you're going through with the ensigns that are going to submarines and even the young lieutenants and, and ensigns that are going to be reactor officers on board the aircraft carrier. So, you know, your, your commander, some of some folks who are there are already selected for captain uh, and you got to go through that. Uh, and that culminates in a four hour final. It's all written exams, uh, pretty, pretty intense. Um, and then you go to a prototype, which uh, I went up to Bolston Spa, which it looks like almost a throwback. It almost looks like a, a scene out of the, the TV series or the movie MASH. Uh, and they actually have real reactors there that operate and you get qualified to operate a nuclear reactor. And that's intended to be about a six month program. Uh, Mike Manazer and I went through this together. They fast tracked us. We did it in about three and a half, just under four months. So we were uh, double timing, doing double watches every night, uh, shift work. You're doing oral boards, more exams. And then after you complete that, the culmination is you get to go to Washington, D.C. and be with the experts that write the engineering manuals for uh, our aircraft carrier nuclear propulsion systems. And again, you're there uh, kind of as a prospective executive officer, uh, many, many more exams, oral boards to include an oral board with the four star admiral before you graduate. So when it's all done, about a year and a half of uh, schooling, it's 54 exams, multiple eight-hour finals, multiple two-hour oral boards. Th there's nobody that makes it through that program that doesn't that isn't an expert uh, in nuclear reactors and nuclear propulsion. And that's by design. You know, thank you, Hyman Rickover. Zero defect kind of uh, culture, more so than any other warfare, especially, which is laudable. Um, also should note that during those years, there's no study at home. So you're always no. at the facility because classification and other concerns. So it's not like you're taking books home and chilling in, in front of the TV, watching football or whatever. 
No, every, every equation, whether it be a differential equation, a triple integral, or learning about the buckling uh, elements of how to build a, uh, build a nuclear reactor and, and why it matters, the size and shape and all those things, uh, all classified. So you've got to go to the facility. And, uh, you know, you had, uh, it was almost like being in combat. I hate to make that comparison, but, you know, when you're in combat, you really, you fly, you eat, you sleep and everything else is secondary. When we were going through nuke power school, you study, you eat, you sleep, and you work out because you had to keep your mind sharp. And, uh, you know, for those of us that had families, I mean, families had to figure out very few. And in fact, my family did not go any of those places with me because they wanted to make sure I could stay focused on it. I mean, it was a big, uh, big sacrifice for my wife and my kids. They would come down from Virginia Beach and visit me down in South Carolina every other weekend so we could be together. But we would study, all of us, uh, about 10 hours on Sundays. Uh, we always took Saturday off and we tried to take Friday night off, but it was, no kidding, a six day a week, every night uh, working hard. Um, so I, you get a lot of confidence in yourself and that what you can do. And uh, for me, I will just say this is very personal. Uh, I probably should have been a much better student when I was at Navy. Uh, I, I majored in I majored in the ice hockey. I minored in my wife when we were dating there. Uh, my academics, even though I was an oceanography major with a kind of a minor in physics, was not my priority. It was when I went to Nuke Power School, and I'm very proud to tell you I had a 3.5 GPA uh, going through that year and a half, uh, and I worked for every every inch of that. And by the way, all of the commanders that were in our class. There were three Navy grads there, uh, Kevin O'Flaherty, Manazer, and I, all 81 grads. Uh, everybody had <clears throat> a 3.5 or better. O'Flaherty had the best grades they'd ever seen in their history. So Kevin was, Kevin was exceptionally smart. Well, I, you and I are kindred spirits with respect to our approach to being a midshipman, uh, which is why we were friends at the Naval Academy. But yeah. um, I often say to mids, if I'd tried as hard at the Naval Academy as I did in flight school, I would have been a 4.0 kind of guy. And I was not, I was a two seven kind of guy. Um, and, you know, so youth is lost on the young, as we know, uh, it all worked out. Should also mention, as you talk about your wife, Linda, we could do a whole show about her and you mentioned yeah. her support during these cr crucial moments. You guys are a franchise together and, uh, you know, she's been there every step of the way since you guys were dating at the Academy. And that, that is very rare. Yeah, it is. And, uh, um, you know, we were, we were out last night with some of our new Nebraska friends and, uh, you know, we were commenting to them that uh, we've lived in 23 different homes uh, to include two different ones, even here in Nebraska. So we're still mobile, agile, uh, still kind of in a deployed status, still serving in different capacities. But uh, yeah, it, it's never, never left us. It does uh, understate to say that she is amazing. She is. So let's wonder you, woman. <laughs> yeah, Wonder Woman, right? Linda Carter. So you finish the nuke power program. You're blessed. I guess what you're warranted or what you get some sort of a, a NSC qual of sorts, right? You do. Yeah. You're a qualified nuclear engineer. Um, you're qualified to operate. And uh, you're right. There's there is a designation that that goes with that. And uh, you're, it's just like a slate when you're selecting for a squadron. Uh, there's a there's a, a little bit of a lottery. You can put in your request, which coast you want to be on. And then somebody else makes a decision based on the needs of the Navy. In my case, this is the first and only time it's ever happened to me. I got the newest and most brand new thing. I got to go be the executive officer on our newest aircraft carrier, the Harry S. Truman. And I was so excited. Uh, she was just coming home from her, her maiden deployment. Uh, and I joined the ship uh, right after um, about the spring of 2000. So I was on board, uh, we were gonna go through the shipyard. And then of course uh, I was on board, we had just entered the shipyard in Portsmouth, Virginia uh, on the day 9-11 happened. So how does the EXO job, what are the specifics of being the EXO? So you are pretty much everything that the commanding officer isn't. I mean, it's a tag team and uh, you are really kind of like the senior department head. There are 18 different departments on an aircraft carrier. So it's not only a warship, it's not only an airport, it's also a hotel. It's, uh, you know, where you feed and manage 
uh, all of the elements of what it takes to operate aircraft carrier, mostly below the flight deck. So the executive officer lives uh, in below the hangar bay. And, uh, you know, you kind of operate from there. Uh, I would go up on the bridge. I was qualified to uh, drive the ship and do that. But you almost do that uh, as a secondary part of your training. Uh, the commanding officer is up on the bridge almost uh, all of uh, his or her waking hours. And I was everywhere else. So I, I walked probably 10 miles a day <clears throat> and up and down ladders everywhere. It was probably one of the most fit times in my life because you're just a little bit everywhere. So how long was that tour as EXO of, of Truman? Yeah, so I was there for two years. <clears throat> I made captain during that time. And, uh, and I'd already selected for my deep draft. And in my case, I wanted to be uh, a captain of a combat oiler. I just thought that mission was super cool. It has roots all the way back to Nimitz and World War I, where he uh, developed uh, underway replenishment concept for the USS Maumee, our first uh, underway replenishment ship. And I got to see the very end of an era, not only what I'd seen in the F-4 Phantom, but in this particular type of combat replenishment ship, a ship that was actually designed and developed by Arleigh Burke himself. Uh, and the basic idea was these were huge ships, not quite as big as an aircraft carrier, but 800 feet long, carry nine and a half million gallons of fuel, uh, mostly uh, aviation and, and uh, DFM uh, for, uh, for our, our oil burning ships. But we also carried weapons and food. And you go to sea, often you're assigned to an aircraft carrier. You have to be able to move as fast as even the nuclear powered aircraft carrier. So these are ships that could do over 30 knots. And in my case, I commanded the USS Camden, AOE-2, the second in the Sacramento class that was built and uh, the ship was 37 years old when I took it over. And I was the second to the last commanding officer. Uh, and I got to deploy that ship uh, out of Bremerton, Washington. So my first time living up in the Seattle area. And I loved the mission. Very singularly focused, 600 uh, person crew, uh, 400 of which were 18 years or younger. So uh, sometimes I refer to myself as a glorified high school principal. Um, but the crew is very focused on what they did and very high performing. I, I love the job. So to review our timeline here from the moment you walk into nuke school, year and a half of nuke school nominally, two years as the XO yeah. of Truman. How long were you CEO of Camden? About two and a half years. Uh, and uh, so from 2003 to end of 2005, uh, I left that ship and all this time you're getting evaluations. You get evaluations as an executive officer, you're having to compete with the other captains on the ship. And then you get compared uh, with the other captains that are in your flotilla. So in my case, the, all the other commanding officers of this class of ship by a Commodore, and you, you, your name gets put back into a review board. And again, they're gonna pick four, maybe five at the most uh, nuclear powered aircraft carrier commanding officers a year. So it was right at the tail end of my time at USS Camden. And I got, I was very fortunate. I got selected on my first look. So boom, you know, it's like when you feel like you win the lottery, you know, you, you get selected to be a nuclear powered commanding officer. There's no greater feeling than getting that phone call. Um, and then you go through this waiting game because they're going to now slate you for what type of aircraft carrier you're going to, you're going to go command. Doing the math, we're talking about six years now to this yeah. point. Right. And as you've mentioned a couple of times, still no guarantees, right? So again, getting selected for nuke power does not mean you're going to wind up being the CEO of a nuclear powered aircraft carrier necessarily. No. Yeah. And, and I can tell you when we were all in nuke power school, you know, Mike Manazer and Kevin O'Flaherty and I were all looking at each other those nights we'd study late and go, which one of us is not going to get picked? You know, because the odds were that one of the three of us wouldn't. And uh, we broke those odds because all three of us did get picked, not all at the same time, uh, but all three of us uh, ended up commanding aircraft carriers. Uh, Mike had the Nimitz and Kevin was the, uh, the captain that built the, the George H.W. Bush. Um, and I got selected for the USS Carl Benson, which I was super excited about. Uh, very historic aircraft carrier, the third in the Nimitz class. Uh, she was home ported up in Bremerton. So I had refueled her from my ship. A lot of time with her. Uh, Captain Kevin Donegan was the CEO. So he and I knew each other well. We had been in New Power School together. But, you know, there's a waiting 
period. So even after you get selected, you got to get in now this kind of conveyor belt of waiting to go take command. So in my case, I had to wait like another year and a half before I would take command. So I had to go do another job. And this was a chance for me to go do another joint job. So I went to what was uh, known at the time, Joint Forces Command um, in Norfolk and Suffolk, Virginia, and, and became the chief of staff of the Joint Warfighting Center. So I did that while I was waiting. Uh, and then eventually you go into the whole command pipeline. You get, by the way, you get to go back to Nuke Power School, five weeks, no tests. So you've, you've kind of been blessed. You're not going to have to prove yourself in front of a whole bunch of people, but, you know, still pretty intense and, and you got to be able to relearn and learn the specifics of the nuclear reactor systems on board your ships. And then they kind of bless you again <laughs> when you finish there and now you're ready to go to your ship. Now, here's what's really interesting. A lot of people won't know this. You know, today there are 47 aircraft carriers in the world, 14 nations operate them. There are only two nations that have ever operated nuclear powered aircraft carriers, United States and France. Uh, we're the only nation that really built the super aircraft carriers, starting with the USS uh, Enterprise, eight nuclear reactors. And then we went into this line of uh, the 10 Nimitz class, which have the, the two nuclear reactors. Um, when you select for command, there are three categories of carriers. Uh, one is a operational aircraft carrier, and that's what you traditionally think of, goes on a deployment, it's got 70 combat aircraft, goes all over the world, does, does combat missions. The second is a, a new carrier build. So I mentioned Kevin O'Flaherty. He was you know, in charge of the build of uh, USS George H.W. Bush. And there's only one place we do this kind of work, and that's in Newport News, Virginia, was at the time Northrop Grumman Shipbuilding. Now, now it's Huntington Ingalls. Uh, and then there's this other category. And it was new, and I had no idea that I could even be in the running for this, but this would be to take over an aircraft carrier that was going to go through a carrier complex refueling and overhaul process. So the Nimitz class carriers, and as well as the, uh, the Enterprise, were, they're designed to last 50 years. Well, the core of a reactor lasts for 25 years. So at the 25 year lifespan of the ship, it goes back into Newport News and basically does the equivalent of a 57 Chevy frame off restoration. It, it is the most complex industrial and engineering project ever devised by mankind. Uh, I was fortunate, I was selected to do that. I questioned all the people that picked me. I said, you know, I only had a 2.4 GPA at Navy. They said, yeah, but you did really good in new power school. So we think you, you're the right guy. And oh, by the way, USS Nimitz and the USS Dwight D. Eisenhower, who had been through the first two refueling and complex overhauls, were, were not the most successful. They were over budget, very late in delivery. We were still learning how to do this. And uh, the briefing I got, and it was Admiral Zortman at the time, he was the head of Naval Air Force. He said, if we don't get this one right, it's likely the program could go away. So USS Carl Vinson was at a critical pivot point in 2006 when I took command. And this is a $2 billion project, $2 billion. And uh, we were still experimenting with how long it really took to take the reactors apart. I mean, this is the equivalent of nuclear brain surgery. Put them back together, start them up. Can't, there's no do-overs in any of that. You completely rebuild all four catapults, all the arresting gear. You take all of the hundreds and hundreds of miles of coax and fiber away, you take all the uh, radars off the uh, superstructure and put it all back together. And you have to do it around the existing framework of the ship. It's unbelievably complex. You take the ship out of the water and put in a giant bathtub and land it on about 1,700 seven foot tall blocks. And the ship just sits on its keel so that you can get after all of the tanks and everything underneath. You even take the propellers off and clean them up and put them back on. So. Uh, it was probably the most amazing, complex leadership challenges I'd ever been through. Uh, I went into it kicking and screaming, and it turned out, again, for me personally, to be the best thing I ever experienced. And at the end of the day, we delivered Carl Vinson on time and under budget. And we've done six of these complex overhauls uh, in our history, and I would argue that Carl Vinson is the best one we've ever done. You describe the XO's duties uh, at sea. What is it that a CO does that maybe the viewers don't think about, or what's what's a day in a life, not in the shipyard, but at sea with an air wing aboard? 
Yeah, so uh, having had a chance to do this through multiple different stages as a second in command, as a captain of an aircraft carrier, and then as an admiral on board the USS Enterprise, which was my last operational at sea tour uh, just about 10 years ago, um, you get to see the job of the commanding officer through these different lenses. And I can tell you for, for the few that have had a chance to do it and what most people um, might see uh, thinks it's pretty glamorous job. Uh, and the best way I can describe it, and this is a phrase that I heard uh, when I actually went through Top Gun in 1985. And uh, the phrase goes, uh, everybody wants to be a cowboy, but nobody wants to ride the range. Being the commanding officer of an aircraft carrier is the person that's riding the range. You are the ultimate safety observer. You are the last line of defense between things going right and something going disastrously wrong. You try to never insert yourself too early in the you know, the thousands of tasks that are happening, this complex ballet of flight operations, operating the ship, uh, being an operational commander, you know, you have to be aware of what's happening underneath the water. Submarines can track you. So how long you're turned into the wind, how long you're driving the ship on a straight line, often going into re refueling operations to refuel the, uh, the jet fuel tanks for the aircraft carrier so you can feed the jets of, of the, uh, uh, on the flight deck. Uh, getting food. I mean, carriers resupply about every week. And that's about three to four hours attached to a refueling ship going 13 knots, less than 200 feet separated. And I mean, it's one of the most dangerous things. And we do it every, every week and people just don't know about it. So the commanding officer is sitting in a chair, either on the bridge of the, the aircraft carrier at the top of the island or on the starboard bridge wing when you're doing refueling operations. And the captain of the carrier literally lives in that chair. Uh, you can sit in that chair on many days for 20 hours straight. I have known many captains, and I can't say that this ever happened to me, uh, but there are captains who actually take their naps in the chair because it's, not, it's too far to go to your bunk. And you have two bunks on board the carrier. You have one that's down in the lower bow ship, kind of the captain's dressed out uh, quarters. And then the captain also has a bunk just off of the bridge of the carrier that has all the screens and all the information in there so that if you are woken up at three o'clock in the morning, you can look up, you've got an instant picture of what's going on on your ship, and then you'll be on the bridge in less than 10 seconds. It is the ultimate on watch job. I don't know of any aviator that wouldn't aspire to want to do it. Uh, the nuke power school scares a lot of people away from doing it. But uh, the actual doing of it uh, as intense and as kind of the marathon approach to doing that job, uh, there's no greater accomplishment than seeing an aircraft carrier out on deployment, 6,000 to 6,500 people living on board a city at sea, doing combat operations, bringing everybody home safely, operating sometimes 10 to 12 flight cycles a day, uh, night operations, going in and out of port, Parking the ship, that's a whole nother evolution. That's uh, pretty complicated. And then the other thing that every carrier captain goes through, I don't care who they are, uh, they are going to take the ship through a shipyard maintenance period. And uh, we don't have any schools for that. We don't really teach captains of aircraft carriers how to do that successfully. As I said, mine was like that on steroids, taking it through a refueling and complex overhaul. But every carrier captain has to learn how to do you know, complex maintenance on their ship. Maybe people don't know that and by now, I guess during this conversation, they could assume that carrier COs are all aviators, either pilots or naval flight officers. Is that necessary? And if so, what did you leverage there that, that would make that necessary? You know, that conversation comes up in a while. I mean, uh, commanding officers of aircraft carriers have been aviators since really the beginning of what I would call, you know, the heart of the mission of the aircraft carrier, which for us was World War II. Uh, and we've never changed that. So this is the 100-year the anniversary of the aircraft carry going to uh, 1922 with the advent of CB-1 Langley. And it, the conversation about whether aviators need to be, uh, you know, you whether you have to be an aviator to command an aircraft carrier, uh, I would tell you the answer is yes. Um, when uh, the most critical thing happens with F-14s coming in, single engine landing, or some other crazy emergencies happening, if you do not have the ability to think like an aviator, uh, and it doesn't preclude us having helicopter pilots as uh, captains of aircraft carriers, but you've got to have 
that understanding that mindset. Uh, and then obviously you got to be taught the nuclear power piece. So those are the two elements that are required. You got to be an aviator. You got to ha you have to have commanded a squadron, and you have to have been to nuke power school. And I think we've gotten that right. I think we've proven over the years that uh, it's a pretty high bar to become a commanding officer of an aircraft carrier. And that's why, quite frankly, uh, the selection rate of carrier captains to admiral is the highest of any single position in the Navy. So admiral. You do not live in the shadow of all of these accomplishments. You've done the transition laudably. You're currently the president of the University of Nebraska, leveraging a lot of the stuff you learned during your five years as superintendent of the Naval Academy, something I got to see at close range during the years that I was at the Naval Institute. So we're very proud of you. We miss you here in Annapolis. Please give our best to Linda and the family. And thanks for joining me here on the channel. Thank you, Mooch. Uh, I love what you do. I love what you do for naval aviation and uh, really proud to be with you today. All right, that's going to do it for this episode. If you're a first time viewer, please ring the bell and become a subscriber so you don't miss anything. Give me the likes and comment. Check the links below for merch and where to get the Punk's Trilogy, my first three novels about life in an F-14 squadron, recently re-released by the Naval Institute Press. Use the discount code PUNKYT at checkout for 25% off. If you'd like to help support the channel, please consider using the super thanks, the heart icon below, or become a patron at patreon.com slash wardcarroll. In the meantime, I look forward to talking to you again soon.